about something different, which is coaching. Coaching is a pre-disciplined conversation about performance or behavior. I'll get this right here on the screen and be able to pull up uh, the right ones here. Um, a pre-disciplined conversation about performance or behavior. And there's also a coaching paradox. The coaching paradox is that you will have to spend more time with the employees who drive you crazy. And what I mean by that is that lots of times in the coaching process, we find ourselves gravitating towards the employees who we like, who we get along with, who seem to do what we ask them to do, and there tends to be a more of a connection there. When you look at coaching as a work product where you're trying to change performance or behavior, you're going to have to spend more time with the employees that already need the work. And so the paradox is you're going to spend more time, more meetings, more goal setting, oftentimes with employees who are a little eccentric sometimes, who make you a little crazy in terms of their effort or their lack of effort. And so that's just one of the reasons that, that coaching exists. If you try to avoid them and if you try not to do what they need to do and help them get to where they want, need to be, then the problem's just going to get worse. So my function is not to make more work for you. And sometimes people see in the coaching process that they're like, I already have meetings and budgets and this and that, and I'm already supervising these other people. Why do I have to spend time with this employee? And the answer is simply because when you look at the impact on the business, and that's always my measure for anything, what is the impact on the business, is that one employee, if you have three or four or five or 10 or 15 working for you, uh, one employee can make a big difference positively or negatively in terms of their behavior, their performance, their effort, their energy level, and also their impact on the morale of the other department members and the other team members. So coaching exists to help you get higher performance, better performance, better attitude, better attendance record, better work performance, quality of work out of the employees that work for you now. And that's the function of our conversation here today. My work in coaching really evolved from my efforts in workplace violence prevention. And those things sound like they're diametrically opposed, but they're really connected. Workplace violence, obviously, it has a range of possibilities from homicidal maniacs on down to people who simply make threats you know, verbally or to people who threaten other folks um, in their interactions, you know, over the phone, face to face, in the field, whatever. So when I looked at workplace violence at the lower end of the spectrum, I was getting a lot of requests from clients to talk to what I would call high risk employees, difficult people having a difficult time in the organization, functioning and getting along with other folks while they were there. So I started working a lot of these 25 years ago with people in these high risk discussions where we talk about their performance, their behavior, their issues, their concerns, their frustrations, their anxieties, their anger. Again, coaching is not a therapy conversation, and we're, we're going to talk in our conversation here today about boundaries, and boundaries are very important. I'm, I'm a big believer in understanding that you have a expectation to do certain things as a supervisor and a manager, and other things you have to draw the line and have good boundaries. So when the conversations start to deviate into personal issues or off-the-job concerns, that that's when we start to use things like referral to EAP or Employee Assistance Program or put boundaries or fences, perimeters around that conversation so you can make sure that you're staying within a, where you are comfortable. I've had coaching clients ask me if they should get a divorce, if they should quit their job. I mean, those are really serious conversations. And, and most of the time I say, look, you know, this is outside the scope of what we're here to talk about. But I want you to be able to have good boundaries when you're working with the people that you have to deal with. Oftentimes, because you may have a, a personal relationship, long time you've known them, uh, been a friend of yours, maybe you were colleagues together, now you're their supervisor. Boundaries are important. When we look at the conversation about coaching. We'll start to draw the business case here in just a second. Let me figure out how to advance the slides. There we go. The business case for coaching employees, we want focused, motivated, self-directed, problem-solving employees who can work well with each other, not cause conflicts. We want them to stay and be happy in the organization for as long as they want to work there. And we want them to be able to promote. One of the values of coaching from the cross, you know, kind of a cross-reference of different possibilities, one is to correct certain behaviors. The other is to help them with skills that they need to move to the next level or to, to have a training uh, gap filled by help with you. And then the last one also maybe um, that to get them to the next level in terms of promotion. 
And that's an interesting discussion because not every employee wants to promote. You may have some employees that are happy doing what they do. And when you look at their work in, in, in the library and the efforts that they provide, they're fine there. And they do a good job, and, but they're not interested in being a supervisor. They're not interested in being a lead. Not in, interested in going back to school, promoting, or, or getting certifications. They're not, they don't, they don't want to do it. And maybe the reason is because they're happy where they are, or when you look at, at sometimes with employees, being a supervisor, as you well know, means budgets and working extra hours and working at home and constant emails and constant conversations, and maybe they just don't want that. They just want to do what they do, and that's fine. I'm of the belief that we take people to the level that they want to be at in terms of where they are in their, in their careers, and we don't drag folks kicking and screaming into the next level if they don't want to promote. But at least through the coaching process, you can say to people, you know, I've given everybody on my team, everybody that works for me, the opportunity to be successful in this environment. The way that we coach is also a good conversation, too, because there are lots of methods. When you think about coaching, if you're over the age of 40, you see it as a face-to-face -face conversation with an employee across the table. If your employee is under the age of 30, maybe for them, coaching could happen by email and even by text. When you look at how we deliver coaching as a face-to-face -face conversation, that would certainly be our priority, seeing the body language and eye contact with the employee. Certainly that would be our top priority. But you can coach over the telephone with no, no uh, body language or eye contact. You can coach over email. I've done it many times. And if you look at the employees who are typically younger, your millennial generation, they may prefer to be coached by email. They may prefer assignments or or, or uh, issues brought to their attention from via email. And when you look at you know the old school thinking about this, you say, well, I have to be face to face across the table in order to coach. You can coach over the telephone. You can also coach in what I call corridor coaching or walking down the hallway, catch them after a meeting or after an interaction with somebody and start to have a conversation just walking down the hallway. There's an interesting sort of shift in vocabulary that I think coaching can have, which is where you use the word feedback instead of the word criticism. And I'm a big believer in the concept of direct, non-personal, immediate feedback. We'll talk about that as we go forward. Direct conversation, immediate conversation, non-personal, stick to business, and feedback. Feedback is a different word than criticism. Criticism means you stink. Feedback means let's talk. Feedback tends to be a little softer semantically, the phrase, for people to be able to digest, and what, what you're talking about with them is simply, let me give you a little feedback about what I heard or saw yesterday, or what I heard or saw during the meeting, or let me give you a little feedback about the quality of your work here, or your work product, or what you're doing that I want you to do differently. I'm also going to talk about a model that I use uh, quite extensively called Keep, Stop, Start. The model for Keep, Stop, Start is, what do you want the employee to keep doing because it's working, stop doing because it's not working, and start doing because it's a good idea. I've used this for many decades, and it's very successful. What it says is, these are the things we want you to keep doing because they're good for the business, good for the team, good for the department, good for you, employee. Stop doing because they're non-value-added activity. They waste time and money and effort, and they're not good for our business. And then start doing because they are good for our business and they are useful for you. So that conversation with an employee that keeps stop start can give you some structure about what you think is important by priority, what you want them to do. And that's the issue for coaching. You have to be able to say, the employee may have a list of sins, a multitude of issues I want to address, something that's, that's uh, you know, five or six things that are critically important, and I, I would agree. I say, okay, how do you prioritize those based on need? What is the impact on the business first? Address those first. And then the second issue for coaching is one conversation, one issue, meaning we don't bombard the employee in a coaching meeting with 15 things. And, and say, here's all the stuff you've got to fix in one day. We say, let me pick the biggest impact on the business, the thing I think that hurts the business or hurts their interaction with our, our patrons or with me or their coworkers the most, and focus on that one issue, one meeting. The other thing I'm going to talk to you about, which seems paradoxical too, is the concept of homework. I give coaching clients homework, and they do it at work. It's not taken home unless they're a supervisor or manager, in which case I'll load them down with stuff to do at the house. But for an employee, an hourly employee, we talk about homework, which they do at work. Homework could be 
a website they go to, a self-assessment instrument they take. It could be an article you want them to read from a trade publication or something in the library journal or something like that. It could be a book. And for example, give them a copy of my book on library security. That will make me happy. A book, an article, a self-assessment instrument, some type of quiz, a video on YouTube, look at this and then come back to me. Take a look at our policy here in organization for this issue here. Review the policy. Get back to me next week. We'll talk about this as our next coaching meeting. So homework, I think, is important because I want the employee to believe that it's not just a chat. It actually has structure and that there's a goal for each meeting. We're covering at least one issue per meeting and it has a limited time attached to it. It's not a 365-day conversation. It's not a once a week for two years type of conversation. It's let's get this problem solved within one or two meetings. Let's get this problem solved within one or two or three sessions. Now, whether it's ego for me or reality, I sometimes believe, and in my process of doing coaching with senior executives on down to frontline employees, that if I can't make headway in five sessions, and that's usually my, my kind of guideline, that I'm either the wrong guy for the project or, or the employee is just not getting it and seems to be tied up in knots about some kind of issue while they're not willing to change. Many times when they come to me for coaching, the ice is already thin under their feet and they need to make some changes to save their job. So my thing is, you know, I'm going to help you as much as I can for, for one to five sessions, however many the, the organization wants to contract for, and that's fine. But you've got to do your part too, employee. It's not just me. And I think you have to save that conversation with your folks as well, which is, I will meet you halfway. I will come to our, the, our meetings and our conversations with as much effort and energy as I can to help you get to where you need to be, but it's not all up to me. It's up to us working together, and in many cases, it's up to you, employee, to do some of the things that we're talking about. So we'll talk about how we run coaching meetings. We'll talk about confidentiality. We'll talk about recapping the report that you give back to your boss or even to HR to put into your coaching file. And I'm a big believer in coaching files. I think that it is important to have a coaching history with an employee, uh, a collection of information which documents the meetings, the conversation, what was promised, what was said, and those go into your coaching notes. The coaching file is not a secondary personnel file. It doesn't have workers comp in it or discipline and like that. It's not a confidential secret document that you keep from the employee. If they want to look at the coaching file, that's fine. Just don't write stupid jerk in a post-it note and put it in there accidentally. But if they want to look at the coaching file, you can say, fine, just set a meeting with me. I'll have you go over it. Because not only is the coaching file useful for how you keep track of what you have talked about over a span of time, but also, realistically, you're going to use the coaching file as a way to help create a valid and accurate performance evaluation for them. These are the things I've talked about with you during the rating period. These are the things I've asked you to do differently or to change or to be different in terms of your performance or behavior, and these are the things I'm going to address in my performance evaluation with you. So start thinking about the people in your library, in your facility, hey, who are... Hey, Steve. Sorry to cut in, Steve. A couple requests from, from folks. Um, would you be able to make your slide kind of full screen? Make it a little easier um, for some of our folks to see it. Perfect. Thank you. If you look at the people that you um, are, are working for you, who are the people that need need the coaching and who are the folks in your uh, facility that, that could be on your list? Stretch your comfort zone around this issue. Start thinking about how you meet with employees, looking at performance issues, behavior issues, or career issues, helping them promote, helping them address training concerns. Take what you need from me, um, download a copy of the materials, and then think about you know what comments your colleagues have made in, in the chat room and in the chat space about what you see from this. And then come back to this material again, take a look at it next week, and, and continue to move forward. Sometimes what happens is people have good energy in this conversation, and then they get tied up in other issues, and then they can't or it won't go forward uh, next week because they just get tied up on stuff. So think about on your hard list today, who are some of the coaching candidates that you're, you're going to get in front of. So we look at coaching as a pre-disciplined conversation. It's about performance or behavior. A pre-disciplined conversation that says, what does this employee need to keep doing or stop doing or start doing? It also could be, and this is interesting to me many times, a post-discipline conversation. 
the post-discipline conversations could be after the employee returns back from, let's say, a suspension for behavior, or after the employee comes back from some type of, of training class where we want to talk about after something has happened, let's say they got they got sent to um, you know sexual harassment 101 or something like that that organizations sometimes do. They'll send employees to training, which I call charm school oftentimes. How do we get the employee back from that session and say, let's make sure we don't do these things over again? So coaching is about improving performance and behavior, fixing skill gaps. And, and the interesting thing with me about fixing skill gaps is that many times the employee will not tell you what the skill gaps are. So you could have an employee that worked there three years, still doesn't know how to use your software correctly. Employee could work there five years and not know how to use one of your strategic systems that you use every single day. They have other employees do it or they fake their way through it. It's interesting to me how sometimes the skill gaps will not be evident because the employee will be too prideful or too embarrassed to come forward and say, I don't know how to do this. And so sometimes you can identify those things carefully and, and be able to address them and say, let's go through this particular procedure or process or piece of equipment or software or financial um, you know, database or whatever it is that they're working on that you can help them build those skills. We talked about the value of coaching for those employees who want to move ahead. And again, not every employee wants to, but for those employees who move ahead, want to move ahead, then career planning and, and promotional support, helping them get to the next level. That could be practice with mock interviews. It could be uh, helping them form their internal resume. It could be walking them through the, the, the panel interview process and what kind of questions they're typically likely to face. And also give, giving them some opportunity um, in the coaching environment to demonstrate their new tools or their use of skills. For example, if one of the things that may you, you need to move from the next level is to be able to do community meetings or talk to the library board or talk to community groups inside the library, then uh, the employee will have to have that skill set. Many times people are afraid to stand up and talk in public and you look and say, okay, let's work on your ability to stand in front of this group of folks and give a presentation about issue X, Y, and Z. Demonstrate that to me. We'll practice it and then when we turn you loose in the real environment, it'll feel like it, it's much more natural. We can also use coaching to negotiate agreements between two employees that aren't getting along. And that process is very structured. Instead of just bringing them into the room and saying, okay, uh, let's, let's hash this out, all three of us together. We, we have one-on-one -on -one meetings, one at a time with each, each coachee, each employee. The first employee comes in and we say, what are the things that the other employee is doing that make it hard for you to get your job done? What are the things that you want this employee to stop doing or keep doing or start doing to make it easier to do your work and for you to get along successfully? Then you send that employee away. You bring in the second employee and you say the same thing. What are the things, the ground rules, that we can create with the other employee, what are the things that drive you crazy, what are the things you need from this person, what do you want them to start doing or stop doing, help me create some ground rules that are four or five things that I can go back to the employee number one and talk to him about or her about, and the same thing back to you, we'll come back to employee number two with those ground rules from employee number one. So we have a series of separate conversations with each employee, and I've done this many times uh, with, with, t with uh, either teams in contact, con conflict or employees in conflict where they don't want to meet together because the emotional temperature is too high. They're not interested in being locked in a room with each other, which can be very stressful for both of them. So what I do is just work through the process. Coach one, go back to the other. Coach the other, go back to the first one. Back and forth until we get these ground rules kind of ironed out, and I deliver the ground rules to each of them separately. In a perfect world, what I do then is bring them back together and say, how do we talk about these ground rules as, a, as you two folks in the room with me, I'll facilitate the conversation. No screaming, no tears, no crying, no anger. Uh, a balanced conversation between three adults where I say, here's what this person wants, here's what, you, what the other person wants. Let's come to some kind of agreement. We can use coaching for teams and to bring in teams and do a keep, stop, start exercise and say, what do we need to do around here that's working? So keep doing it. What do we need to stop doing around here because it's not working? And what should we start doing because it's a good idea? And oftentimes we can use coaching as a way to resolve conflict between you and another employee, for example, uh, would be a conflict resolution opportunity for coaching. So we just define coaching as one or more pre-discipline or post-discipline conversations about performance or behavior. 
And if you look at the coaching guru out there, it's Marshall Goldsmith. Marshall Goldsmith says, the employee must be ready, willing, and able, and the employee must own the solutions. It's not you always telling them what to do, but uh, therefore selling the ideas and trying to get some compliance or buy-in from those employees that are willing to be coached. As I've said, my model is usually one to five sessions. If I can't seem to get much, much traction or much change there, then I may not be the right person or the employee is just not willing to change. And there's, there's the rub and that's the shift we need to make. And we're going to talk about this shift from coaching over to discipline. And that's, uh, that's the simple fact. When coaching stops working, when the employee does not have the ability or the skill or the, the uh, wisdom to be able to take some of the things that you're suggesting and use them, we have to switch over to discipline. There is a process for that, and it's called a crossroads conversation. A crossroads conversation is your last coaching conversation with an employee before you switch over to discipline. The coaching conversation, which is the, the um, personal accountability meeting, and that's the, the phrase we use, a PAM, or a personal accountability meeting, is the last coaching conversation before we switch to discipline. It is a crossroads. When I think about coaching in terms of a definition, metaphorically, Oftentimes I say that you're the little tugboat and that the employee is the big aircraft carrier. If you go full speed into the side of the aircraft carrier, you're going to sink. If you're the little tugboat, metaphorically what you do is you bump or shift or nudge the employee in the right direction. And the more nudging you can do over a span of time, the greater the course correction will be. The little tugboat pushes the aircraft carrier in the right direction. Pretty soon it's going in a completely different direction than it was first originally. So metaphorically, you're the tugboat. What coaching is not is what I would call life coaching. So you see people that are life coaches and oftentimes they talk about aligning your chakras and all this kind of stuff which is not always business specific. So it has boundaries. We don't talk about personal issues with the employee. We don't give them life advice. We don't give them psychotherapy. We don't dwell into their past childhood, things like that. We focus on the business issue. And so as long as you have those boundaries, you're going to be in good shape. Lots of ways to look at coaching from a, from a also known as perspective. We could call it support or guidance or, or mentoring. It's a structured help. It's a new direction for an employee. It's advice. It's, it's career planning help. It's career planning support, promotional support. It's training help. And then my dad, the guru, Carl Albrecht, my dad uh, talks about assisted discovery. I think that's a great phrase. What it means is many times in your facility, you can have those types of conversations with employees where they get it and and they get it soon and they get it over a span of or they get it over a span of time and as a result they are different in their performance or behavior and at the end of that conversation at the end of that process they feel like they've learned these things themselves you certainly had a big part to play but assisted discovery is is where they start to take ownership uh, with the entire process especially um, uh, that's a really good sign in the beginning so we talked about boundaries. It's not therapy. It is a pre-discipline or post-discipline conversation about performance or behavior. Learning styles is key. Some employees, based on age, uh, will want to engage with you face-to-face. -face. Maybe others, younger, uh, may prefer email or or less face-to-face uh, -face kind of a format where you give them things, they come back to you. You give them assignments, they come back to you, and it's less of a structured conversation. Um, diversity plays a part of it. Alignment plays a part of it where you say, who uh, is the best person to coach this employee? Maybe it's not me as their supervisor. Maybe it's another supervisor. Or maybe I'm a better supervisor to coach a certain employee in the library than, I, than it would be if this somebody works for me. And this, this happens occasionally where you say, I just connect better with this person than my coworker does, my peer supervisor. Or this person connects better with my peer supervisor than he or she does with me, then maybe they can do some of the coaching here so that it's less of a of a struggle uphill. And the last part we talked about of homework is, again, a structured conversation where they have uh, a copy of a policy, or you give them a cheat sheet, or you give them a template, or you give them an example, or you give them a case study, or you give them something online that they look at, a video, uh, a website, a self-assessment instrument, a per personality instrument, something like that. And as a result, you have a conversation about that next, next meeting. So the homework exists. They do it at work to be able to say this is not just a chat, but we have actually structure here. I'm always keen in the coaching process to talk about the, the important difference between behaviors versus labels. You've got a lousy attitude as a label. 
you're always late is a label. You're not a very good team player is a label. We need to switch our conversation and coaching over to behaviors, and this also helps a lot when dealing with uh, performance evaluations and things like that. You're always late needs to be, I need you to be at work by 9 o'clock ready to go. You've got a lousy attitude needs to shift over to when you engage with library patrons, when you engage with coworkers, when you talk on the phone, when you attend staff meetings, and you say these sarcastic or difficult or rude things, these are things that hurt our business, I'd like you to stop those. When you look at behaviors, that's what the employee can address. Labels, they can say, no, I'm not, or you're wrong, or they'll have that internal rationalizing conversation that they don't believe that you're correct. Behavior is much more easier to, to focus on concrete actions, and it's easier for them to identify. Whether they agree or not, it's easier for them to identify what you're talking about. One of the challenges in coaching is getting through to that employee who minimizes or denies or rationalizes or blames and makes a lot of excuses. And I have a, a phrase I call putting a fence around it where I say, I understand what you're saying. Let me jot that down. That's an interesting comment. Let's go back to what we, what we were just talking about, about what, what changes I'd like you to see. You hear them, you acknowledge the comment, but sometimes it's just there as a placeholder because they don't want to take ownership for, the, for their behavior or performance. I think you put a fence around it and you keep going. One thing we talk about in coaching is confidentiality. If the employee comes in and tells you they buried their parents in the basement, you got to tell the police. It's not a confidential conversation because you're not a priest or a lawyer or a psychologist. What it is is a coaching conversation with confidential boundaries, meaning if someone says to you, you know, I hate my coworker, you're not going to go to that person and says, you know, Dave says he hates you. What we're going to say is if it affects the business and breaks the law or violates policy for our, our organization, I've got to do something about it. So if you tell me something that where you're breaking the law or violating policy, I'm going to address it. Otherwise, if you tell me some things about coworkers or other supervisors or patrons or something which has a confidential nature to it, I'm not going to share that outside this room. But it's not blanket confidentiality. You may be, as part of your conversation with your boss or your boss's boss or human resources, be asked to write after action reports for coaching. And I think there the important thing is to recap what the employee agreed to do, when and where, and how and why, and what you um, saw as the crux of the conversation and what the next steps are. So I met with an employee about attendance issues. We talked about the importance of getting to work by nine. We talked about getting up earlier and, and you know missing traffic or taking an earlier bus or whatever the solution was, get a rooster, get an alarm clock, hire a wake up service. We put those into the coaching notes and your after action recap back to your boss or for your coaching files can say here's what we talked about on this date and time. The reason for that process is important is as you know many employees will take ownership for certain things and many employees will not take ownership and say I don't remember talking about that or I don't think we talked about that back in February and here it is June and you're still discussing the same issue. You can use your after action reports, you can use your recaps, you can use the notes that you put into your coaching files to remind them not only of what conversations you had, but how it's going to also attach to uh, how you're going to write their performance appraisal. Part of coaching for me is to use praise, to catch people doing things right, as Ken Blanchard used to say, and to give people recognition and reward and, and, and positive strokes for what they do. And coaching can be very supportive. It says, I care about you as an employee. I care about your success here. I care about your happiness and morale here. I want to retain you. You're a good, good uh, contributor to our organization. I want to help you get to the next level if that's one of your, one of your goals. And speaking of goals, coaching should always have goals, shared fates, shared responsibilities, shared deadlines. It's not just a one-way conversation, but a two-way conversation. Everybody knows SMART goals. Uh, this was drilled into my head in graduate school 10,000 times. Specific, the goal is measurable. The goal is attainable, which means the employee can do it. It's relevant to the business, and we can track it. Specific, measurable, attainable, relevant to the business, and trackable. So when you look at SMART goals, every coaching meeting should have a goal. One issue per meeting. We're not trying to dump on the employee. It's not a you know, collection of all their sins. It's one issue per meeting, and we prioritize that issue to be the most important one that affects the business the most. Lots of ways to look at coaching in terms of what we're trying to address or fix, work performance, violation of policy and procedure, you can't smoke in the dynamite factory, attendance, 
attitude with coworkers and patrons, conflict between coworkers and patrons, working together successfully in a team, and having good service orientation. Those are what I call the big seven, and you can coach any variation of those in terms of a performance or behavior. And how do we demonstrate success in the coaching process? We see change. It's as simple as that. The employee complies with our policy. They get to work on time. They turn in their, their after action reports on time. They do this, they do that. We see improvement in their interactions with coworkers and peers and supervisors. We see positive changes in their attitude. We see positive changes in how they interact with patrons and library uh, board members and elected officials and other city, city people. We see them, and the last two are important, taking responsibility and having an accountable kind of a framework for you, which is they keep their promises. They say, I'll see you tomorrow at 9, and they're there tomorrow at 9. I'll have that for you at noon, and they, you have, they have it for you at noon. So they're, they're taking ownership, they're demonstrating responsibility, and they're being accountable for their promises and accountable for their actions. In a perfect world, that's how we demonstrate success. So we talked about this a little bit in terms of the structure, a goal for each session, one issue per meeting, respect each other's time, they got to come to the meeting on time and so do you, no physical or electronic interruptions, and then be careful, again, confidentiality, not too much, but again, you say I have boundaries with this person in terms of I won't share information about other personality conflicts that they're having, but if it violates policy or breaks the law, you got to do something about it. We give the coachee, the, the employee, some homework, things to read, things to review, websites, things that may be uh, library specific, inside your organization, intranet information, again, copies of policies and procedures, things that you want this person to study and get back to you. And then have them prepare for the next session by being ready to come back and brief out to you what you have given them to look at, template, cheat sheet, copy of the manual, um, downloaded screens from the, from the internet, etc. And then preparation for your next session is, again, taking notes, documenting the kind conversation in your coaching file, which is one coaching file per employee, specific to each employee. It has the, the juxta of the conversation in it. It has the goals. It has the promises that this person made that they're going to make these types of changes. And that's an interesting sort of um, wrap-up point for how we, we end coaching meetings. Now, one of my colleagues is Gwen Kramer, who's an attorney in, in uh, California. Um, he's a labor law attorney. He works for only for organizations. He doesn't sue organizations. He only does uh, defense for them. And he has a really great phrase at the end of each coaching session. And it's basically, in essence, is there anything, employee, that we've talked about here today in this meeting that, that you need to share with me that, that interferes with your ability to be successful? Is there anything, employee, that you cannot do in the things that we talked about to be successful in what we're discussing here? Is there anything that's holding you back from being able to make the changes that I've asked you to make or we've agreed upon? If their answer is no, that goes in your coaching file. That, that goes in the, in the conversation as, as them taking ownership. If the answer is yes, I have some concerns or I'm not sure about this, then, then continue the conversation and, and, and get some, some kind of you know, boil down to what you need to solve their, their issue. But one of the reasons for that recap conversation is it helps you later on to say, hey, if we have to switch to discipline, back in February when we talked about this, I asked you if there were any obstacles, if there were any reason why you could not uh, do the things that we talked about, and you said no. And as a result of that, then the next step for us is moving to discipline because you're not seeing the changes in your performance or behavior. So I think that's a great wrap-up for each coaching conversation. Is there anything holding you back? Is there anything we haven't discussed? Is there anything that you see as a roadblock to you being able to do these things successfully? If not, I'm going to expect these changes right away. If you look at the C's here up on the screen, the first two are pretty clear. Communicate the issue with the employee. Clarify it so they can see it from outer space. I mean, it's, it's crystal clear as to what they need to do. Ask for solutions that, that they can implement themselves so the buy-in tends to be higher. Or suggest your own. But the most important part up here in terms of the three C's is commit. Will you, employee, commit to the change that we have talked about? Will you commit to the plan that we have discussed? Will you commit to stop doing certain things, start doing certain things, or keep on doing certain things? Will you be able to do this starting immediately? Certain performance or behavior issues, they're going to need time to ramp up to full productivity, whether it's understanding software or being able to work some type of technical uh, project. It may take some time for them to get to full, full productivity and performance. But certain things, they should be able to do it right away, starting immediately. 
in terms of attitude or sarcasm or conflict with employees, again, um, changing the behavior right away. If you've had a coaching meeting or a, any kind of performance discussion with an employee and, and they've totally agreed and they say, this is, you know, absolutely right, boss, you're absolutely right, I'm going to have to make these changes right away and, you know, thanks for bringing those up and then they, they run out of the room and you think, wow, I'm a genius. I'm the best supervisor ever. Look how easily I got them to comply. Look how quickly I got them to agree with my perspective. Um, I'm going to go to lunch and treat myself to a steak because I've done uh, an awesome job today. And then what we realize is they just said that to get out of the room. Sometimes the employee will agree wholeheartedly with you, speedily, just to be able to get out of the room because they don't want the conflict, they don't like the discussion, they believe if they, they agree with you completely and wholeheartedly about what you're going, they're going to do differently, that you'll take the pressure off. I always say, as part of the commitment piece, is don't just tell me what I want to hear. I want to see these this starting immediately in the three or four areas we talked about. The specific examples I gave you in our discussions over a span of time, these are the things I want to see starting immediately that you take ownership and you commit to act. So don't tell me what I want to hear. Show me in your performance or behavior. I think you got to call them on that so you don't get that agree, 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 and then you don't see the performance or behavior change. Many times in coaching, I get a, a range of emotional responses. Uh, if you read a book, which I like quite a lot, some of you may know it, some of you have it on your bookshelf called Crucial Conversations. I think that's an awesome book for coaches. I think it really works well for, for supervisors at all levels in the organization. Uh, Crucial Conversations was written by uh, Joe Grenny and, and uh, McMillan and a couple other cats, uh, consultants, and uh, about two million copies of that book sold. Um, they wrote a sequel called Crucial Confrontations, which has a blue cover. Uh, Crucial Conversations has a red cover, paperback. Um, I highly recommend the book. They talk about a crucial conversation is having three elements. It is an emotional issue for the employee. It is uh, an, emotion, uh, an issue that there are many uh, choices as to what to do. And it's also a complex situation. So lots of options as to what to do. Emotional issue for the employee and uh, oftentimes disagreement between you and the other person is a crucial conversation. And what they said in the, in the book was we do really well for most of our conversations, 90% of them. 10% of our conversations, which are crucial, not so much. So in terms of these reactions, again, think about it from the employee's perspective. Why is it a crucial conversation for them? Tears. I've seen males and females cry. I make people cry about once a week. But by the time they get to me in my office, uh, they're meeting with me about things that are really career-threatening. Um, it has quite a, a corrective uh, nature to it that, that if they don't make these changes, there's going to be significant problems. Uh, when they cry, I, I give them some time, I give them a box of tissue, I let them compose themselves, but I don't end the meeting. Um, I'm not being hard-hearted, but if every time somebody cries, male or female, and you end the meeting, then the, the message is tears will get me out of this tough conversation. So I think you're em empathetic, but you keep on going. If you get employees who are angry and are not listening to you, I think you've got to reschedule. Anger is a, is a suppressing emotion, is a secondary emotion. It oftentimes interferes with their ability to think clearly. Either you give them in time in the meeting to compose themselves or you reschedule it. If they disagree, if they argue over each point, if they cannot see the wisdom of, of your, your concerns, if they cannot see the path, I think you have to call them on it. And what you say is, as your boss, B-O-S-S, -S, right, as your boss, I think these things are important. And I'm sorry you don't agree, but I think they're important as your boss, and here's the changes I'd like you to make. If they argue over each point, I think you have to say, look, I can see you have energy about this. I can see you are, are concerned about this. I see you have strong emotions about this. Let me go over my thoughts here. Let me go over the plan I have for this discussion here. Let me go over the notes that I have. I'll turn it back over to you at the end of that conversation, but if you stop and you, and you disagree with me every time we argue about it, I'm not going to be able to get through this all the way, and maybe if I've done my job correctly, I'll answer your questions and I will help you see the, see the direction we're trying to go. So I think you have to say, look, let me run the meeting, and then I'll turn it over to you. And if they don't agree, sometimes you have to wear your boss hat. And as I said, if they're overly agreeable, I'm always suspicious because many times employees will say these things just to get out of the meeting to take the pressure off. So I think you have to say, back to the C's, it's not about the communication, it's not about the clarify, it's about the commit. Insubordination is an interesting one to me. I have kind of a jaded perspective about this. Um, I see this with HR people all the time that I work with. 
employee refuses to sign a written warning, employee refuses to sign um, any type of, of uh, performance evaluation or performance improvement plan, employees, the uh, HR just says, well, right, refused to cross the bottom and then turn it in and we'll file it away. I disagree. I think employees that don't sign this type of stuff are insubordinate. I think it sets a wrong message if we just say, yeah, go ahead and be uh, you know, hard-headed about this. I'm not asking you to agree with the performance evaluation. I'm not asking you to agree with the performance improvement plan. Signing it simply says that I've talked to you about this and that you've received a copy. So when they're insubordinate like this, it's a bad precedent from my perspective. But I don't typically win that argument with it, with uh, HR. They just say, have them you know, right refuse to cross the bottom and put it in the file. I'd like to be the employees to be appreciative and cooperative, and, and, and usually they are. So again, back to the Crucial Conversations book. Opinions vary, stakes are high, and emotions run strong. Uh, people don't agree. They're emotional about it, and the stakes for the employee could be up to and including discipline or termination. So that's why coaching conversations are perceived as crucial conversations from you, from your perspective, and from the employee's perspective as well. So I'm a big fan of the book. I believe in it as a, as a good um, kind of Bible for coaching. It talks about a lot of scenarios and situations where these three factors come into play and how you address them. Every employee that you have is listening to radio station WIIFM, that stands for What's In It For Me. They want to know why you're having the coaching conversation. They want to know the value for them. They, they have their own hidden agenda or overt agenda as to what the issues are that they're, they're concerned with. Coaching, from your perspective, helps employees know where they stand with you. It tells them specifically, not in terms of labels, but behaviors, what they need to improve. Not get to work on time, but be here by nine. nine. Not be nicer to patrons, but stop using sarcasm, don't roll your eyes, and make your body language more neutral and approachable when dealing with, with angry patrons. These are the specific things we want them to address, not just labels, but behaviors. Coaching certainly tells them that you can walk them through the process of setting their personal and professional educational goals to be able to promote or to move forward in their library career, whether it's their educational goals or certifications. Uh, it helps them decide how to promote to other positions in the organization, what they need to do to be in the right place to be um, considered for those positions. It helps you give them role play and practice and support for the interview process. Again, we talked about the ability to meet with employees separately and then back together again at the end to resolve conflict, conflict through the use of ground rules. Ground rules are those three or four carved in stone. This is what one employee says he or she will do or not do in support of the other employee and what the other employee says he or she will do or not do in support of the other employee as well so that we can come up with these ground rules. Ground rules for conflict resolution could be things like don't walk away when I'm talking to you, don't look at your phone all the time, don't touch me or curse at me. Those types of things could be ground rules in terms of employees who are in conflict. And the last part of coaching is it rewards them through praise and recognition for what they're doing, for their efforts and their accomplishments in your facility. So back to our initial conversation this morning of the coaching paradox, which is at the bottom here we see you've got to spend more time with your most difficult and challenging employees because they're the ones who need the most help. Your rising stars, your shining stars, the other people that are in charge when you're not there, the other folks that do the tasks when you give them, get it right the first time, and then some, they're not the ones that typically need coaching. They need support, praise, we got to make sure we don't get into teacher's pet role with them where they get all the fun stuff and everybody else gets all the drudgery and also that we don't burn them out. That's another issue with Shining Stars which is too much work, uh, too much piling on stuff onto them because they can get things done can get them in kind of burnout mode. Well besides the coaching paradox, the other part is the self-fulfilling prediction. The, the expectation you have, the prediction that you have about dealing with an employee positively or negatively has a big impact on your motivation and performance with them and their motivation and performance. I mean, we see this all the time in hiring. A woman gets hired for the library, people say, wow, she looks terrific, she has a lot of skills, great personality, great attitude, patrons love her, she's going to do great here. And she turns out and does great. We manage to greatness. Or we say, here comes a guy we hired, I'm not that fond of him, he's kind of just okay, um, he kind of rubs people the wrong way. 
So we manage that expectation, and he turns out to rub people the wrong way and not be very effective. So I didn't come from a world where I see ponies and unicorns and rainbows, but when you think about having a positive expectation for coaching with an employee, things turn out to be positive. If you have a negative expectation, this isn't going to work, this is probably going to be a failure, they're not going to get it, they're not going to understand me, or I'm not going to be able to convince them, then it tends to go downhill from there. I think you have to give yourself a motivating sort of a pep talk that says, look, I can do this successfully, the employee can do this successfully, we will work on each of these issues successfully together and, and strive for that goal. And the second part, again, is, is spending more time with those employees who may not be your favorites, but they're the ones who need the most help. Performance evaluations are a good way to look at coaching uh, need. What are some of the things that jumped out in previous supervisors' performance evals that you can look at? Talking to your bosses and, and peer supervisors about specific or performance or behavior issues with employees that work for you or for them. Um, you can offer coaching services to your staff, uh, or you can talk with your peer supervisors about perhaps they coach some of your folks or you coach some of them, uh, their folks, if they have better alignment or you have better connection with them. We also want to meet proactively with high-risk employees or at-risk employees, danger of being fired, danger of, of quitting, um, danger of really serious or severe conflict with other employees. We don't want to wait for the big event to happen before we step in. And also, in a more positive way, we can also meet with the employees who are on the fast track to promote and to move to the next level and to help them get to the next step level in, in the city or the county or to get to the next level in their career uh, depending on their educational or professional goals. If you look at this process, these eight steps here, it doesn't always go perfectly smoothly, but this is an example of, of a typical coaching process. We look at the first step is we, what we give them to take a look at, copies of policies, cheat sheets, manuals, that type of stuff. We talk about the purpose of the meeting. We describe specific areas of performance or behavior we want them to address. We ask them to generate some solutions to get their buy-in. And that's one of the steps here in step number four, and kind of five, is where once the employee starts to say things like, I suppose I could, or I guess I could, or perhaps I could, yank on the fishing pole and set the hook. Here, you're trying to get the commit step, not just the communicate and the clarify, but the commitment step. So once they start to move towards, I suppose I could, or I plan to do this, or I guess I'll do this, or starting tomorrow I'll do this, yank on the fishing pole, set the hook, and then recap that in step number eight when you talk about what, what you agreed to do. So once they come up with some things, give them praise for it, fine-tune and discuss the solutions in five, talk about what they do well, try to end the meeting on a, on a positive note, talk about what your next session is going to look like in terms of a recap of, of what you talked about here, uh, the homework assignment that you gave them, and also uh, you can do something for them which I call the demonstrated use of tools. The demonstrated use of tools is where you say, um, go forth and meet with this employee and tell me how it goes or try this technique with a patron and tell me how it goes, or go stand in front of the library board and give this presentation and tell me how it went. Those types of demonstrated use of tools can be part of the next session conversation. And again, we're closing the meeting with, thanks for coming in, let's talk about what we agreed to, you're going to get a rooster, hire a wake-up service, get a better alarm clock, whatever it is that's their attempt to solve the problem. If they can't get to number four, if they can't come up with anything from step number four, if they're baffled as to what the solution is, sometimes you get to put on your boss hat and say, this is what we're going to do. Look at these open-ended questions here. Um, I don't think we script out everything. Uh, greetings, insert employee name here. How was your weekend slash baseball game slash soccer game? I think we have to have a little flexibility, but sometimes politicians use talking points and they try to stay on message. And so, these are some of the good questions you can have here in terms of staying on message. And the fourth one there, an SDB, that is a self-defeating behavior. Self-defeating behaviors are things employees do that they could fix immediately with a big impact. Coming to work on time or, or coming to work late is a self-defeating behavior. Coming to work on time is the antidote to that. Being sarcastic with co patrons or coworkers is a self-defeating behavior. Stopping that behavior is, is successful or the antidote to that. Who do you have a good relationship with here? Who do you have a bad relationship here? If you were in charge, what would you do differently in your department? These are all good open-ended, self-directed, extractive questions. Part of the problem of being a supervisor sometimes is we get trained to ask 
yes, no questions when we should be asking more open-ended questions. Instead of, did you call that guy, what, you know, did you do this, did you do that, who did you say? When you called him, what did he say? What was the conversation like? When you did this, what was the next step that you thought about? Those types of self-directed questions, not just you telling the employee all the time, but them giving you some input and feedback as to what they have done. My world tends to be kind of around the career development part of coaching, especially for library employees. I do a lot of, you know, how to get to the next level type of coaching, performance improvement, how do we get them to the, to the job knowledge, job skills, training that they need to have. And then I spend a lot of time in the corrective area as well. Uh, sexual harassment, racial harassment, sarcasm, uh, conflicts between people, uh, a skills deficit where they're, where they're just not in, in uh, compliance with what they're supposed to do. And you can see the goal for each of these is a little bit different. Um, executive or strategic, I would work you know, at the senior library director level and then on down through corrective down to the frontline employee or even a supervisor with issues. Special problems coaching is typically employee assistance program or referral to a um, uh, an outside expert or somebody to help with a certain specific problem. But you look at the goals for each of these from direction to personal skills uh, enhancement, to job skills enhancement, to compliance with our policies or peace. Those are all um, issues that we face when we're handling certain types of employees with certain types of situations. The PAM or the personal accountability meeting I talked about, it's a speak to Jesus cards on the table meeting. It is the last conversation. L-A-S-T, the last conversation you have, last coaching conversation you have with the employee. The next conversation after this you tell them will be discipline related. Follow your policies and procedures, follow your MOUs for those of you in union environments, but the personal accountability meeting, the key phrase there is accountability, not you nagging the employee or begging the employee to comply. It's you saying simply, I want you, based on the number of conversations that we've had, to understand then I'm at the end of my coaching conversation rope here. The next conversation will be discipline if I don't see the changes in performance or behavior. The key phrase in the personal accountability meeting is their accountability. Document this conversation, stick to your guns. Next meeting, if you don't see the changes you want, should be discipline related. Oral warning, written warning, suspension, whatever your policy is or whatever your process is. This is um, uh, an interesting sort of a connection here between the employee's potential contribution versus their real contribution. Some of you may have plow horses. They pull the plow until they get stuck sitting on a rock and then they sit there waiting for your help. The plow horse needs praise and support to be creative and to problem solve. Rising star, again, be careful about teacher's pet and also about not burning them out with too much work. Problem child, I don't spend a lot of time on in the coaching process. I use progressive discipline. I also use our pr probationary process to help screen them out since they tend to have problems with their actual contribution versus their potential contribution, both low. The toughest challenge up there, and you may know this already from your experience, is the smart slacker. Knows how to work hard, doesn't want to. Actual contribution is low. Potential contribution, because they've been there for a long time, is quite high. They just don't care anymore. I talk to smart slackers about their legacy employee status. You've been here a long time. I'm asking for your help. I want you to be able to work hard all the way through up until you, when you want to leave or retire. Sometimes they check out about five years before they retire, and you've seen that, that, those types of, of concerns before. The problem with smart slackers is previous supervisors oftentimes have let them get away with slacking, and they're smart enough to know when to do it or not do it. They work hard for when they want something from you and not so much the rest of the time. Plow horses, praise. Support. Rising stars, be careful about burnout. Problem children, use your progressive discipline and your probationary process uh, to, to give them the sense of whether or not they want to stay or go. The most tough, toughest one up there, the most difficult challenge is the smart slackers. We can write books and books about these guys. They know how to work hard. They don't want to. Their performance often, oftentimes is, is driven by some type of hidden agenda. Oftentimes they're frustrated because you got the promotion they didn't. They don't care for you or they feel burnt out because they're topped out, they can't promote to the next level, they're tired of working in the library. I think you have to confront that. And again, they're the paradoxical um, equation, which is you've got to spend more time with those employees who already make you a little crazy. So last, before I take some questions from you, my dad talked about this in our conversation. Uh, I always talk with him about my coaching um, situations to get his feedback, and he sort of thinks in these three roles is the way coaching works for him. I agree with me as well. It starts out as tutorial, it moves to advisory, and then it ends at assisted discovery. So in the first part of coaching, you are in a teaching modality. You're teaching these folks what to do differently in terms of 
performance or behavior, what you expect from them. As they begin to get it, as the light turns on, as you see progress in the homework that you've given them, in the conversations that you have, in the support and praise, you're taking on more of an advisory, consulting role, kind of a mentorship role. And at the end of the process, whether it's the first meeting or the 15th meeting or the fifth meeting, and it takes a week or three months or half a year, they move into assisted discovery, which is they get it themselves, they start to feel ownership and they understand that they have a role to play in their own success. And so with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Joe and, and take some questions from you. Okay, thank you, Steve, once again. Um, so everyone, folks, we, we can take a few questions here using your questions um, tab or pane on the control panel. Um, Steve, just one question so far that's come that has come in, um, I guess really a general question about coaching. Are you aiming coaching as a discipline or a retaining or re, excuse me, retraining tool for a specific staff member that's falling short, or would you say for, for all staff in general? I, I think you'd use specific for those specific staff members that have the concern, and then also you make coaching available to everybody who, who wants to, to partake of it. Um, sometimes employees see that you spend a lot of time with one, one employee over the others, they feel left out. Coaching should be perceived as available for everybody, but you're really going to use it on those that have performance or behavior problems. Coaching is certainly positive in terms of getting you know, the employee to the next level, but most of what coaching, especially that I see, is corrective. So you're going to start with your priorities is what, what are the issues that impact the business that that employee needs to stop doing or, or do something differently. Okay, got you. Um, no other questions have come in, but I'll give folks just one minute to, um, to type in any questions if you have them. I'll remind you that we did record today's webinar. It will be uh, available on our CD archives page along with the, uh, a copy of these uh, slides by uh, next week, Monday at the latest. They should be there. Uh, I'll also remind you that because we had some, some go-to-webinar tech problems uh, with Dr. Steve's first webinar, titled The Challenging Patron Workshop. Um, he's going to do that again for us on April 27th at 10 a.m. So if you're interested, um, you can go ahead and register for that. So just one last question uh, before we wrap up. Uh, Steve, if you have a regular one-on-one -on -one meeting with staff, how do coaching meetings tie into that? Or would you say it's part of the regular meeting? I think the one-on-one -on -one meetings with staff could be uh, about general library issues or general general workflow issues and concerns, and then the coaching meetings are much more specific. They're much more structured about specific performance or behavior issues that you want to address. Mm -hmm. And actually, one just follow-up: How long would you say an average coaching session uh, would last? Understanding that it, you know there can be some variation depending on the employee. I think 45 minutes to an hour is tops. I mean, again, you're trying not to beat down on the employee. Um, I think their energy level is about 45 minutes to an hour. If you have significant issues, then schedule two meetings. Mm -hmm. And last question is: Would you say the coaching file uh, should be maintained in the HR office or in the supervisor's file? De definitely in the supervisor's office. It's not a it's not a secondary HR file. Um, it, it, it stands as long as the performance evaluation period. So if you do evals once a year, then you keep the coaching file for one year, and then you toss it and start fresh after you write the performance evaluation. So it's not a secondary personnel file. HR doesn't need to see it. It's something that the employee can look at. It's not confidential. It's just a recap of the conversation so that you and the employee remember what was discussed. Okay. Perfect. All right, and with that, it's 11 o'clock. So, Dr. Steve, once again, thank you uh, really for the series of webinars that we've had. We look forward to having that encore performance at the end of April. But uh, thank all of you for attending, starting your week with Rails in this webinar, and wish you all a good rest of the week. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Joe. All right, thank you. Bye now.